Welcome to Essence 2018. Thank you for coming. Welcome to today's talk on algorithms and perfumery. I have the great pleasure to um, speak with Nicolas Cloutier, who is at the entrance right now. So we will have two parts, and I thought, I don't want to ha keep you hanging here, so there's an introduction that we'll, I will be doing, and afterwards, afterwards we will have a uh, conversation with Nicola. Why an introduction? Because algorithms in perfumery are quite, how can I put it, are complex, and I want every one of us to be to have a, the basic understanding of what an algorithm basically is. And so I will start off with a very simple analogy. What is an algorithm? An algorithm is basically nothing more than a set of steps to accomplish a task or to solve a problem. There's nothing more to it. Since we are in the motherland of coffee culture, this could be some kind of al algorithm. This is what you do when you want to create, uh, prepare a cup of coffee with a cafetiera. I don't know the English term for it. You boil the water first. Uh, not everyone does it, but it's better for, for the quality of the coffee. You grind the coffee. You fill the warm water, or hot water, into the cafetiera. You put in the filter with the coffee. You put it on the stove. You wait until it boils, and then you serve. On a more formal level, an algorithm is a procedure for solving a mathematical problem in a finite number of steps that frequently involves repetition of an operation. Uh, I understand this is not a poem, and is really a little hard to understand, so basically it is a step-by-step -step procedure for solving a problem or accomplishing some end, especially by a computer. Now, the fact that this is normally done by a computer, it implies that we have automatization here, and often it is used to solve complex problems, more complex than making a coffee anyway. So, algorithms, I would like to go and, you know, I'm constantly looking at the door to, to see if Santa is coming in. Um, I would like to give you some examples of algorithms in, in real life. So this is a really uh, small, a little random selection, a fraction of examples that uh, indicate the spectrum of where we find algorithms in our daily life. So it's not comprehensive at all, it is merely for uh, illustration. We find algorithms in navigation systems, like Google Maps. So uh, you have a route-finding algorithm that will lead you from A, in this case, Milano Centrale, to B, the mall, Piazza Lina Bobardi. Then we have, now this is a, my, my worst nightmare as a, as a child. Uh, I won a, a drawing uh, contest. I was a run, runner, uh, runners up. I got 200 Deutsche Mark, which is approximately 100 Euro now. And I was looking to buy a Walkman, a Sony Walkman. And my mother tells me I should buy something that makes sense, that maybe make, make my intelligence grow. So I went for a chess computer. Since then, I have been a very, very unhappy, frustrated person, because I lose every single chess game against that computer, even if it's level zero. Now, the computer, what he does, or what the computer does is, he uses a, a so-called minimax algorithm, a search algorithm, to go through the the huge, the huge tree of possible moves and to find the best move so that the computer can beat Hario Sodono. Then, of course, in real life, we have algorithms 
in e-commerce. Uh, so you look for, you go to Amazon. Uh, you look for, Amazon started off with books. You go um, and look for a book. There you find some ratings, some reviews, and a description. And Amazon tells you what others have bought and why you might be buying another book as well. Also, you have this kind of algorithm with ukes.com, for example, in the world of fashion. You go to have a look at the, a nice pair of sneakers, and then ukes thinks that you might also like these models. Now, the, um, what we he have here is um, the context of uh, an e-commerce catalog. So we are, these are just two examples of suggestion engines. And these are suggestion engines are basically in place in the realm of, in the realm, please have a seat, Nicola. Take your time, relax. It's good to have you here. Uh, in the realm of recommendation systems. Um, you find them e e equally on YouTube, on eBay, and whatnot. Speaking of recommendation systems, we find them also in digital content suggestions as well. As I said, YouTube, Spotify, not a big fan of Spotify because I'm a musician also, and every time someone listens to my CD on Spotify, I get zero revenue. So anyway, but it, they work with a recommendation system, and uh, what they do is they work with a personalized filtering engine, an engine that browses the huge database of films and series, in the case of Netflix, and displays what the system predicts to be interesting for you. Now, when it comes to Amazon, Netflix, YouTube, eBay, uh, because I mentioned them, uh, many, many more recommendation uh, systems, at the center of them is an algorithm that, that is based on so-called collaborative filtering. And I think we can consider Amazon to be one of the pioneers of collaborative filtering. So what happens in collaborative filtering? So basically, the algorithms process information from hundreds of millions of events to build a predictive model which is capable of guessing your personal interest based on the interests of other, of similar users. And this happens in real time. So you have peers with the same interest, and then you have yourself, and the uh, personal, um, I'm sorry, the collaborative filtering will provide you with an offer, with an offer that is interesting for you, or is supposedly to be interesting for you. So the key is, creating an intelligence system with huge amounts of relevant data. So I cannot stress enough how important data is. And the system processes these amounts every time, numerous times, numerous times, and it's a learning, um, a learning system. So we have artificial intelligence here, basically. Of course, we find recommendation systems in perfumery also. Let's start off with an example in selective perfumery that is rather designed for the, say, average perfume consumer. So let's take a look at Sephora.com. Sephora and the Fragrance Finder is a quiz with questions that hopefully identify a selection of suitable fragrances. So what are the questions? I'm looking for a gift for her, a gift for him, something for myself. How do you, uh, what appeals most to you? A citrusy ocean breeze, a flower-filled garden, a warm, cozy coffee shop, a lush, mossy forest. What type of scent are you looking for? Feminine, masculine, doesn't matter as long as it's good. So these are questions, you have seen them in so-called fragrance finders numerous times, I presume. If you are in an, in an elevator, 
who do you want to notice your scent? Just yourself, the person next to you, everyone. When will you wear this at work, for a date night, brunch with friends, all the time? And how do you usually shop? And this is interesting. How do you usually shop? So you have three options. I look for bestsellers. I go by the rating or writings. I want what's new. And then there is a match. What really struck me when I went through this fragrance finder is that there's no question regarding your preferred perfume, regarding your preference. Uh, I mean, the perfume that you own already, that you like. Uh, nothing about perfume notes. Probably assuming that the average buyer doesn't know anyway what a note is, a perfume note is. So all the questions revolve about, around the user's personality, their shopping behavior, the occasion they will be wearing the, they will be wearing the perfume at. And remember, this is a database with tons of data behind this fragrance finder. So what are those data? What are the parameters? Probably the launching year. Probably because I want what's new. Probably the consumer ratings, uh, the categorization in terms of gender, the sales volume, because I want bestsellers. So very commercial. And I'm not judging. This is just an observation. Other than that, I don't know. In contrast to this rather commercial approach, let's make a trip to the world of the aficionados, those who are passionate about perfumes. And where do we find them, apart from Essence? If you find them online, you find them in the, um, in the realm of um, communities, like base notes, communities and forums. So base notes has uh, amassed tons of uh, data since its launch in 2000, building an, a directory of fragrances with reviews, ratings, top heart, and base notes, or Frequentica. Uh, I mean, every one of you probably knows Fragrantica, Fragrantica being most, one of the most renowned community with members around the world. Uh, and as you can see, versions in many languages. Many of them I don't speak, although I speak 20 languages. No, just kidding. Um, so with a different style of depicting the, the perfume pyramid and acknowledging that every individual perceives the notes differently. This is probably why you can vote for the main notes that you perceive. Or the German website um, Parfumo.de or Parfumo.net, which is the English-speaking version. Uh, this is um, a directory that was, uh, or a portal that was created in 2009, and it has a directory of more than 100,000 fragrances. Uh, so the, the directory goes from mass market, stuff that you find in a drugstore, mastiche, prestige, in a little niche and luxury also. And I had the pleasure of talking with uh, its founder, Christoph uh, Polatsky, uh, who I'd like to thank for sharing his insight here a little bit. Um, unfortunately, Christoph couldn't come to Essence. And Perfumer as well, Perfumer.de as well, has valuable data, information, personal preferences, as you see, people rent, uh, rate the scent, the longevity, the sillage, I'm sorry, the sillage, and the bottle, to be honest, I don't know what, what is meant with bottle. But also, the members are to put the perfume in, in the context of where they wear it, or when they wear it. So it's a little bit what we see or what we saw with Sephora, but here, but here we know where it comes from. It comes from the community. People share their collections. If I'm not mistaken, the collections in total combine 2.5 million 
fragrances, not, not different fragrances, just 2.5 million fragrances are included in the collections. And you can see, I'm sorry, you can see that this will lead to a big database. Again, ranging from mass to prestige to luxury. So at the center of Parfumody is the database. And what is interesting, and I think what sets Parfumody apart from other forums and communities is that they try to use this database um, by creating more touch points. Like as you see here, uh, a perfume, Parfum Baraton, which is a perfume, online perfume advisor. And also by using this database uh, through this online perfume uh, advisor with apps. So they have a mobile app and they have an Alexa app. So I find this really interesting. So this is basically to play around with the media or with the applications that are out there. Um, um, I think this is something worthwhile looking into, although it is very broad in terms of the range, but I highly recommend that you check out uh, those sites as well. And then in the realm of um, artistry perfumery, we have the concept of nose. So again, welcome uh, to Essence, Nicolas. Um, I will say a little something about nose, okay? If that's fine with you, please feel free to correct me if I'm not representing the stuff uh, correctly. Uh, but then we will have the chance to talk about it. So nose is an online boutique, but also has a boutique in Paris. And it is focusing on artistry, niche, luxury, perfumery. So my understanding is that it is aimed at people who are, are, who are passionate about perfumes, who love perfumes, or, and or who want to learn more about perfumes, more, want to discover new perfumes of great quality. So they have this diagnosis tool. And I would like to go through this diagnosis tool with you. So first, I'm logged in. Uh, this is a little intimate, but I put in my last perfumes, three of my last perfumes, and then you can indicate what you want to... Uh, can I, ah, there you go. What you, when you wore them, okay? You can say, currently, I'm wearing it now, or I wore it last year, I used to wear it five years ago. You launch the diagnostic, And then you turn off the screen. And then you go to the next slide. And this is what you get. This isn't something that I entered. This is what I got. This is the diagnosis. So I get an olfactory portrait telling me that I have a preference for cheaper um, fragrances, also telling me something about my preferred olfactive pyramid. And this is drawn from the three fragrances that I provided as an information. So you can imagine what kind of intelligence and database is behind this tool, because I gave them three names, th three brands, in this case three brands, and then three fragrances. So there must be a lot of information behind it in terms of the, the uh, perfume family, in terms of the notes, and maybe it is weighed. Then I get some recommendations, and probably I can sa get samples to test and then provide notes with information if I liked it or rather disliked it. Now I had the opportunity to visit the, uh, the Nose Boutique in Paris two or three years ago. So I went to the shop and I spent uh, some time with one of the human uh, perfumery advisors, experts. Um, I, got, I received some samples and 
um, what is it called, a blood test. And then I would express my content or discontent. And this information, or this information was then attached to my profile, because you need to create a profile. So here I have my evaluation based on the experience in the beauty store. Oh, I'm sorry, in the beauty concept store in, um, in Paris. But also, as you can see, this, this system will continuously learn and in, it, in iterative steps about my preferences and will help me a find a better solution or uh, find a better solution in terms of finding a better fragrance that suits my preferences. And also, to be honest, if I am an amateur, I just go back quickly and I'm new to the perfume world, this also gives me the opportunity to learn more about the vocabulary, vocabulary and to position myself or my taste in this realm. Um, this being said, I, uh, yeah, I hope um, I, I described Nose's concepts, I mean, the, broad, the basic concept, accurately enough. Um, I would like to invite uh, Nicolas Cloutier um, to the stage, so to speak. Please welcome, uh, give a warm welcome to Nicolas Cloutier. Thank you. Oh, there you go. This is yours. I will sit by you. Okay. Yes. So, for those who don't know Nicola, again, thank you for coming. Nicola is the co founder of Nose. Um, and the, are you the president of Nose also? And he's a verit veritable. Uh, new economy entrepreneur. So first Tuesday, you know, stuff like that, right? So, and an, an innovator. So, um, I have prepared a couple of statements and questions that I would go through with you. Please, if you have a question or a, a statement or an hypo a hypothesis, please feel free to raise the hand and I will see to it that you can pose a question or make a statement. Um, now, Nicola, you have a powerful system and a database, but you also have the boutique in Paris with human beings, perfume advisors, who can also read between the lines. They see my reaction, they see how I'm, how I'm dressed, so maybe they can derive something from that information. So I would like to start off this conversation with the juxtaposition of two statements, and maybe you can comment. Uh, so, I, so you can read it. <laughs> Algorithms can never replace a good human perfume advisor. Fragrances are simply too personal. Or algorithms are more reliable because they are based on systematic parameters, less contextual, not based on a hunch or a gut feeling, a personal feeling. <coughs> Uh, thanks for the invitation, uh, first. Um, for me, these two statements, I agree with, with both, actually, and somehow, because for me, the perfume diagnosis is not like... It's like the x-ray for the doctor. It does not replace the doctor. Um, technology... Perfume is way more factual and less emotion than people think. Uh, that's why I think that algorithms are relevant in that industry. Um, the, what is important to know is if you put algorithm on top of data that is wrong, it will just generate wrong statement. That is what I can see with so many technologies, either in perfumery or in other, other industry. So uh, for me, you know, for the first statement, why human is important because technology can only capture a level of data, unless it's a, it's a, it's a technology, artificial intelligence that can hear as well what the human is saying. Uh, when we do a perfume diagnosis, for instance, we ask question, profile question, age, sex, country, last three perfume you have wear. Uh, but the person will give much more subsidiary to it. We we'll say this, I wear this in summertime, this in winter time day, night, and so many, or this has been given to me by, as a gift 
never liked it really much, this kind of thing. So everything about algorithm, it doesn't mean anything algorithm if data reliability is not there. That's the first premise in, uh, I, I could comment as the statement. Um, but what is for sure is people, they follow, if we stay in perfumery, they follow a track. They've been influenced by their mother, their father, their childhood, the people they loved, they ate, ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend. So you cannot say it's not like fashion. Fashion, you see a, a, a suit, you say, I like the, the style, I try to fit, fit me well, it's in the trend that I like, what's the price, I pay if I have enough budget and so forth. While perfume, you can adjust, except maybe for journalists, which we can say that they are spoiled with perfume, so they get lost in translation somehow. Um, with, with people, it's very fact-based. They are migrating, and you have age as well, that is quite important. Uh, so f for me, algorithm, if we work like, who knows Big Blue and uh, Kasparov here? must be uh, more older people, <laughs> usually. Yeah. Um, Big Blue was developed by IBM in the 80s to beat uh, Kasparov in the chess. It was the first machine that was developed in order to beat a human in a game with intelligence, let's say. Um, and the thing is that... Um, it, it has reached a certain point when Big Blue has won again Gasparov, and that was a big change across any industries. It's where we can say that technology has took over on human. Uh, that's a fact. At equal data, technology is more reliable than a human uh, to perform certain tasks about uh, processing data, right? Not about uh, cooking or more complex human being uh, behavior. So for me, algorithms are reliable to compute data. They are more strong. With equal data, we have tests, uh, not only at Nose, with uh, niche partners. There's one over there at Secret du Marais uh, in uh, Madrid. We have tests that as well uh, in the big distribution industry. We've been involved for the last three years in R&D project uh, undercover. Uh, test that with huge teams, technical experts and so forth. And we have been able to prove that from that since 2016, uh, the technology we have developed can, with equal data, replace a human being. Thank you. Fragrance finders in retail are biased because the result is limited to the assortment the retailer has. Is, is that true? Is it bad? Is it good? Is it inevitable? Like it, it, it depends what is your business model. If your business model is uh, one of the um, community, the co community aim is to find across the broad what is the perfect scent for someone. Uh, at Nose, if I can speak for Nose, which represent niche industry, um, the idea is how to find your an original uh, exclusive perfume that no one or not so many people wear. That's, that's, that's a, a, a goal, right? So for me, uh, fragrance finder and retail are based because the result is limited. Uh, if, the, if there was, uh, if we were recommending at nose perfume that you can find elsewhere, first you would need to have all the sampling, which could be a difficulty. <laughs> and the second thing is, uh, is you, you would not satisfy a customer because uh, unless you have a, a warehouse that is completely huge. So nose is already having 600 fragrance and to sample that is already a nightmare. Yeah, uh, I think I, I, I can see what you're saying. And plus also, I mean, uh, we see it every year here in Niche, uh, I'm sorry, in, at Essence, that there are new, new fragrances and new houses coming up. But then figure out well, how many launches we have every year 
in the, in the entire perfume industry. And then, of course, a retailer can also have the function of a, can have a curating function also because people are otherwise overwhelmed. So. I would say it, it, it even go, uh, if you look at the big actors like uh, uh, the, the Sephora, Douglas, and so forth, in uh, many of these stores, they don't even have testers to make people try the fragrance. You may recommend fragrance, and you end up that you miss about 20% of the tester on the shelves. So for me, you know, it's not only as important to recommend what is sold at the place, but to also have these testers available, right? Thank you. Uh, since we had a look at one of the players, fragrance finders in re retail do not serve a real purpose. Uh, because eventually people will be drawn to what is being pushed promotion-wise anyway. So marketing campaigns, uh, ubiquity of new launches. Uh, so in other words, automatic fragrance finders are in many instances nothing more than a marketing gimmick. Uh, with Algorit, you can recommend many different things, right? You can recommend uh, uh, if it's finding the best fragrance to someone, it's quite challenging. The experience we have uh, be uh, given not only on niche but uh, generally speaking is that, uh, for instance, if you come with a fragrance that is uh, a perfect match from a scent perspective, but is in a teenager bottle for a 60-year-old lady, as one of the use cases that uh, I've been through you will have a kind of huge wall, right? <laughs> a big no. So I would say that uh, Fragrance Finder is not just about algorithms, it's also taking into account other elements than um, just applying algorithms to formulas. Yeah. Yeah. So what is the main challenge in perfume algorithms? Was it, what is the trend? Is it more taking into account more contextual information? Or what do you see as uh, the, 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 the biggest challenge for perfume algorithm is, as I said, the, cost, the, the, uh, the database on which you rely on. As I said, no good database, as I see, like, if you take the formulation in the industry, 90% uh, of the formula there are wrong. Uh, they are work by marketing teams uh, that pretend they know that, for instance, patchouli for uh, 45 above is uh, wrong in some market for some ladies. They don't want to hear about these beatnik stuff or hippie style. So a lot of the formula that you find in the industry, they are completely wrong. So you can have the best uh, NASA scientific p person working an algorithm. But if you work from a database that is wrong, which is the current data available in the industry, on the internet, for instance, or from the brands, then you work on something that looks pretty, but that the result of the bottom line is not as good. So the first challenge is us knows it's been nine years now that we have been involved in this project. And from these nine years, three perfumer with one of 25 years of senior perfumer, master perfumer involved, it's very challenging to involve a senior perfumer of 25 years that is one of the best perfumer in the industry. It's like giving an internship to one of these guys. So uh, it's very challenging to do that. Uh, and there was two perfumer and keeping from time to time with the coping with all these novelties, I think that algorithm is <coughs> it's the second step. It's so, so Nicola, so I, I, we better understand. So when you say the formulas provided by the, <coughs> by the brands are wrong, so you mean the categorization, the, the, the notes that are attached to it, or, and you, <coughs> you re-smell and then you put the... We, we have our own, everybody wonder how we do it. And that's a kind of black box, which we don't uh, explain. But for sure, the formula in the industry are wrong. Uh, and if you dare to take the 10 best perfumer around a table 
and you ask them to qualify a perfume, they will most probably argue for two hours. So it's a kind of nightmare just to figure this out. Mm. Second step after is algorithm. Algorit knows works with artificial intelligence, machine learning and stuff like that. That's where it's the second challenge of being able to teach a model to learn, not to get what we say in French, uh, over learning. Uh, that's where the big, big, big complexity starts. Thank you. So, um, so because the, uh, I think we have already uh, stressed the, um, the complexity and the, the problem that if you have big data, but the data are wrong, that you cannot work with them. And if the, if the, intelli the system isn't intelligent or is not properly um, created, then you cannot work with it. So what will the future bring, uh, Nicola? Where will there be any creation of perfumes based on algorithms? So what do you see, you know, when, since you are an innovator and you know how, how things I think what, what Nose has, uh, has developed, we, we are the o only technology that has achieved more than 100,000 perfume diagnoses so far. Um, this was the first step of our strategy was to develop a primo diagnosis, right? It's the fact of having someone that come to your store, do his perfume diagnosis for the first time. The second, for me, the, the second challenge, once you succeed in that, um, is how do you manage a customer life cycle? Customer life cycle um, being, um, at Nose, we have about eight customer segment, 23 steps in each customer life cycle of each of these uh, segments. Uh, so, for instance, having a customer in Omnichannel goes online, personalizing content according to perfume diagnosis, um, pushing different content according to uh, taste and preference. That's the new trend and the new challenge, not only in perfumery, we can see that in other industry. Uh, I think that th that is the main challenge that I would say as we speak. Um, and it brings the, level, the, the, the world in a second level because people, if you push, it's, it's very funny because I, I have registered myself to uh, the three biggest retail chain in the industry, uh, also applying to a Fidelity card. <laughs> I suggest you to try that. That's very, very uh, funny experience. You will uh, first, when I feel this, with these guys. I said, I'm a man. I mentioned that in front of the cashier, uh, just in case there was a <laughs> misunderstanding. And I've been going through all these steps for each actor. And today I receive uh, makeup offers. I receive uh, so many things in the customer. And I purchase as well in each of them to try to understand what's going on. So that's why I say perfume diagnosis is Interesting. It's what uh, it's uh, it's it it gives some data at first, but after that is how what you do with it. We can talk about big data, but big data for me is more a telecom actor that has I don't know or one of these chain that have like uh, per country maybe 12 million customers you don't start to do big data with 100,000. It's a, sh a lot of data. But uh, for me, we, we might be engaged now in new steps that will involve us in big data. So th that's going to be another challenge. Uh, a third challenge is in order to generate so much diagnosis, means that you need to be able to have so many API calls with technology and so forth. So you become an architecture provider. We're having discussion these days with Amazon, not Amazon in online, but Amazon Web Services, for instance, for those who knows what I'm talking about, uh, uh, and other platform, so that we can be able to 
now that we master the perfume diagnosis, the next step is how to master with big quantities of data. Not only big data, but also about transaction. So that gives a big, broad scope about how I see the next future challenge if you have master such technology. In terms of what we can do also, as you point out, for instance, we could definitely point out to semi-custom fragrance. I would not dare to say that um, we could go to 100% customized fragrance. I think it's minimizing the work of these great master perfumer, which are artists. Uh, you know, if it would be, it's not like cooking. So I think that uh, all these brands that say they do custom fragrance, they mix the alcohol with the base, putting a signature of the name of the person on top of the bottle. Is that really customization? I doubt. Uh, but having algorithms that can predict formulation, knowing the complexity of each formulation, I think we are quite far from it. Thank you so much. Do you have questions from, from the audience? Do you have any or statements or predictions? Can we have a microphone for the gentleman here? Thank, thank you very much. Do you currently charge companies for being recommended on your website? Uh, that's a funny one. <laughs> Uh, we don't aim to do like Colette did, uh, and somehow to uh, you know, we uh, it's it's a valid point because at some point, nose is not only the perfume diagnosis; it's the only store in the world that there is a real master perfumer that selects fragrance by fragrance. We have 20, 30 brand requests per month, and we curate each fragrance uh, in the store so that we don't have 12 rose patchouli that smell the same. It doesn't mean that anything that is not at nose is not qualitative. It means just that there's a very solid work to have a kind of complementary uh, collection. And for sure, given the success and seeing all these brands coming by, for sure we could maybe down the road, we could ask for some exposure but we try to work in a business model that's try to, uh, to work with some guidelines and rules. Maybe I'm too much of a blue sky person. Uh. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well then, it is a pleasure to say thank you, Nicola, for being here, for your expertise. Thank you for coming. Have a good time at Essence and uh, a lot of, I wish you a lot of uh, new discoveries. Take care. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you.